Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Tom Boley, Chief Market Strategist at EarningsBeats.com, and this is Trading Places Live. It's Thursday, November 11th, 2021, and I'm pre-recording this uh, Trading Places Live for just a little bit later this morning. Uh, let's see, currently we've got uh, futures. Uh, let's get the latest here. Futures currently are up following uh, the sell-off the last couple of days. We got the Dow futures up 43. S&P 500 futures up about 17, and the NASDAQ futures up almost 100. So uh, getting a little bit back from uh, what we saw in terms of selling the last couple of days. Of course, that's been induced by some very hot inflation data, which I believe uh, will uh, be very short term in nature. When I say short term, I'm talking about uh, this time next year. I don't believe inflation is going to be on anyone's radar, um, but between now and then, uh, how high does it go? I don't know. We're going to take a look at that during today's show. Um, speaking of today's show, let's go ahead and take a look at today's agenda. Then we'll get things going. So we'll start off with the daily market recap, Getting get into talking technically. Uh, I'm going to take a look at inflation. Is it real or not? Um, and then jump into earnings and wrap it up with the three you must see. So let's get this thing started first. I want to take you over to earnings beats. Uh, we had a great session last night. We actually selected the 10 equal weighted stocks in our earnings reaction portfolio. Um, this is the second quarter of our earnings reaction portfolio. So it's a little bit of a test just to see uh, how it performs. Our first quarter wrapped up. It was actually doing really well until the last, um, well, first 10 days of November. And uh, I think the inflation scare chased a lot of folks out of growth stocks, uh, this, the, that portfolio had some growth stocks in it. Anyway, we ended up uh, trailing the S&P in the first quarter, the inaugural quarter, by about four uh, percentage points. So we'll see how the second quarter goes, but we did unveil those 10 stocks to our members last night. Now, our bigger portfolio draft, like I like to call it, is going to be next Thursday evening. So that's November 18th. That's when we'll be selecting, if you look at our... Um, track record. We've been tracking these portfolios now for quite some time. The model portfolio up 223% since 11-19-2018, while the S&P is up 72%. So it has been uh, roughly a tripling of the uh, S&P 500 over the last three years. Uh, and again, that uh, draft period will be coming up soon. Uh, but this quarter, actually, the model portfolio has trailed just a couple basis points, the S&P, but that's not been the case with the aggressive and with the strong AD, which have both trounced the S&P 500 so far. Still got another 10 days to go. Um, who knows? I mean, maybe it's a repeat of what we just saw with the earnings reaction. I hope not. But, uh, you know, market never know what's going to happen with the market. Long-term track rec record, though, very good. If you're interested in seeing which stocks are being drafted into these various portfolios. It'll occur next Thursday, the 18th, after the market closes. And uh, anyone can come in that's a, a member of our service at Earnings Beats. So you need to be at least a 30-day trial member. So let me go back over here. You can start your no-cost trial right there on the homepage. Just click that button and get things going. Um, but we do have a free newsletter. Many of, uh, we got literally tens of thousands of folks on our Earnings Beats Digest newsletter. Uh, so just simply type in your name, email address, hit that subscribe button. We'll get that out to you. It's a three times a week newsletter, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, normally delivered around 8.30 in the morning or earlier. So you have plenty of time to uh, take a look at it before the market opens. And it's a very brief read. I mean, two minutes tops. You got two paragraphs and a chart. Um, but they're, these charts are just focused on the things that are important to us at earning speeds. All right, let's move on to what's going on or what went on yesterday in the market. So on Wednesday, <clears throat> excuse me, Wednesday, November 10th, another down day for the markets. We saw the Dow Jones down 240, S&P down 39, NASDAQ down 263. And on a percentage basis, that was the big loser yesterday. We're actually down close to the 20-day EMA um, on the NASDAQ. Dow and S&P still have a little bit more room to go. Mid caps, small caps also both down considerably. Mid caps almost nine tenths of 1%. Small caps down about 1%. So everything's pulling back and it's kind of uh, 
strange, I guess, if you follow the market, maybe not so much, but you're getting in these moves to the upside and it's like you're waiting for these pullbacks that never seem to come. And then you finally throw in the towel. You're like, all right, I'm just going to jump in. And as soon as you do that, of course, that's when you're going to get that pullback. And it's probably going to be nasty. And then you're going to swear the stock market's rigged. Um, stock market's not rigged. It's just the way it goes. I mean, these, these uptrends tend to go, you know, fairly quickly, um, you know, or consistently, maybe not always quickly, but pretty consistently with not a whole lot of selling. Um, it almost gets boring day after day after day, seeing the market go up. But then when it starts moving down, it gets much more exciting because it tends to move down faster than it moves up. Anyhow, we'll see what happens after the last two days, but definitely market rolling over here in the short term. And quite honestly, it was due for a pause. It was due for a little profit taking. Um, so I'm not at all surprised. In fact, talked about this earlier this week <clears throat> with the inflation data coming out. That's been the one thing that spooked the market in 2021. And we had the uh, PPI, I think it was the PPI on Tuesday and CPI yesterday or vice versa. Anyhow, both out the last two days and the market, you know, and it came in hotter than expected. So the market kind of did what you would think it would do, sold off. Looking at sectors, utilities up about eight tenths of 1%, staples three tenths of 1%, same for healthcare. These are all defensive groups. These tend to do better when the market's weak. So there's nothing wrong with this action. Uh, a lot of times when these three groups lead and the market sells off, I get emails that'll say, hey, Tom, you know, you got defensive groups leading here. Uh, is that a bad sign? Is that, you know, the sign of maybe a bear market? No. When the market's going down, these groups almost always lead. It's when the market's going up for an extended period and we're getting constant leadership from these types of groups. That's when I would be worried. I don't want the market to be led to the upside over an extended period by defensive groups. When the market pulls back, this is exactly what I would expect. Money rotates out of aggressive areas and go and looks for more conservative, more defensive areas. So I think that was very normal behavior based on the way the market traded yesterday. Um, energy took a big hit though, crude oil prices dropping and you can see energy coming down right near its 20 day moving average. It hasn't quite closed below it, but you can see that PPOs rolled over. It just seems like this group's gone a little bit too far and maybe we're gonna get that breakdown. I would look maybe back to about 55, 54, 55 as support, um, potentially around that 50 day moving average. And then technology, second worst performing group, a lot of money rotating out of the aggressive growth areas. Anytime we get an inflation scare, if you just think about it, the earnings growth is eaten into by inflation. So if the market begins to think, hey, we've got inflation problems or uh, you've got uh, maybe money managers, who are saying, hey, I just want to be a little bit more defensive. Inflation was a little high. This, this is going to be a group you're going to sell. You're going to sell this group. You're going to sell communication services. You're going to sell um, most areas of consumer discretionary because these are all the areas that are generally going to be growth oriented. All right, uh, let's keep moving. Got the 10 year treasury yield. I will say the bond market is closed today for Veterans Day. I want to thank all the veterans out there for all your sacrifices, all the families, uh, the sacrifices that you've made for those serving as well. Um, can't say uh, enough about uh, how proud we are in the US to, uh, to have uh, all of your sacrifices over the years. So again, uh, thank you for your service. 10-year treasury yield though yesterday did take the big uh, move to the upside. We went up um, 12, almost 13 basis points. So 1.56% uh, on the yield, but it was coming at a time when it was ripe for a move back to the upside. If you look at the uh, trend line here, and this isn't perfect, but it's probably pretty close. Let's just draw that right up there. I mean, if you connect the major lows here um, in yields since July, we've been trending right along this and we touched it right before we came out with the, uh, I think it was the CPI report yesterday, which was hotter than expected. But here you can see the movement to the upside. Uh, the trend is still in place. I would then go in and mark resistance, which uh, I would say still is that 175 level more recently, 169. But that's a, a range that I would be looking for the yield uh, from this trend line to the downside. If you wanna 
uh, uh, support area, the yield support area. I think this triple quadruple top breakout right here that we saw at about 137, 138. I think if we did break the trend line, that would be the area I'd be looking for because that we broke above that quadruple top, never went back down and tested it. So we could still go back down to that level. But right now, the market seems to be more focused on the hot inflation data. So when the bond market opens again on Friday, my guess is that we go higher. But I just would be looking for this range. Uh, maybe we go back up to the upper end of it. Maybe we pull back to the bottom side of it. Um, but this is the range that I would be looking for uh, until the market tells me which way it's going. And I think it's going to be a pretty significant move. Uh, or not, not in terms of how far it goes, but significant in terms of, you know, are we in a, in a period where interest rates are still rising? Are we in a period where they're, more, they're consolidating or even moving lower? Because how you want to structure your portfolio is a little different based on those two scenarios. All right, let's uh, wrap that up. Now, what you can see, though, is with that move to the upside, you see the financials turning up and industrials really starting to make a move. And they don't have much further to go to move to about a two month, a little over a two month relative high versus the S&P. Any movement to the upside in the yields generally helps areas uh, within transports or within uh, industrials, especially transports. So we'll be watching for that. All right, let's move on to talking technically. Um, here you can see the S&P 500 uh, large cap index just, you know, continue to move up. It was a big move up. Um, so that's been continuing this theme throughout most of 2021. We really only had a couple of periods where the S&P got hit hard. And that was when we got the initial, went through that initial stage of the uh, inflation scare right here back in February. And then September, which historically is not a great month to begin with. Outside of that, I mean, for the most part, we've just been slowly trekking higher and higher. So I suspect that this move is going to be contained. I think we're, once we get past the data and the initial sticker shock, um, I suspect we'll, we'll hang on. So I'm looking probably for the S&P 500 to bounce off of its 20-day EMA, assuming it gets there. Uh, I think it probably will here over the course of the next week or so at some point test that 20-day. Could be today, even though futures are up. Could be, you know, tomorrow, Friday, maybe early next week. But once we get past, I would say maybe the middle of next week, the second half of November tends to be pretty strong, especially once you get in toward the uh, Thanksgiving holiday. So I'm expecting maybe a little short term pullback. But other than that, I, I expect we're going to go back higher. I don't think we've seen the high for the year. I think we've, we're going to go up one more time. Uh, and again, that move probably starts more toward the middle to the latter part of November would be my guess when we actually make that breakout. Um, let's take a look also at the uh, healthcare area. So I wanted to pull up these defensive groups and just you know go through these just for a, a minute. Um, you got the double, triple top here on the XLV back in August, September. We moved down, we trended below the 20. Now we're trending back up above the 20, which is crossed back above the 50. So my guess is we're going to go in here, maybe fill out this cup. It looks like a long-term uptrend followed by a nice little cup. So I think a move back up to about 136 is probably in order for healthcare. And then I'm looking for sideways consolidation before a breakout into year end. The XLU, not quite as strong. We haven't got back close, as close to the August and September high, but we are trying to trend above these moving averages. Um, I would continue to watch for that. So utilities definitely have room back to the, uh, you know, 69, 69 and a half area. Also, when interest rates are rising, um, you know, that kind of is an offset to utilities because as treasury yields rise, the dividends on utilities don't look as attractive because the more guaranteed dividends or interest in the case of uh, the 10 year treasury yield is rising. So those who are income oriented, might look a little bit more toward the treasury yields, but I don't think the yields have risen enough to really put a dent in the, uh, the relative strength of having those utility deal, uh, yields. So anybody who's a dividend uh, investor, those who look for the dividends, I think will still be searching out utilities. So I'm expecting 
still a move up into that 69, 69 and a half area. Uh, whether or not we get the breakout, maybe we'll see. I'm not quite so sure we're going to see that breakout in uh, 2021. Um, consumer staples. Now, consumer staples have broken out, and I like to follow the consumer stocks, both discretionary and staples. And you can see the staples group making the breakout. Consumer dis discretionary already did it a while back. So discretionary is outperforming. But the thing that definitely helps is that um, two thirds of our GDP, it's been estimated two thirds of our GDP is consumer spending. So as long as, you know, we've got, uh, um, as long as we've got good solid action in both the XLP and the XLY on an absolute basis, that's when I'm still feeling pretty good about the economy. Because again, consumer spending, two thirds of the GDP. So we want these two groups to do well, the XLP and the XLY. So final one I'll show you is the XLY. I don't think there's any disputing how well the XLY has been doing. A huge move up throughout October and into early November. Now, yes, we've had a pullback here the last three days, but my gosh, you can't keep going up at that rate. We went up from the 170s to above 210 in four weeks. And that's a huge move. You look at just about any other time, um, and this is one of the areas that we had talked about where the relative strength was starting to pick up the relative PPO on a weekly basis. This is a daily chart, but on a weekly basis, the, the um, relative PPO of the XLY versus the S&P 500 had hit an area where we tend to see money rotating back into consumer discretionary. And that's exactly what we saw in this breakout. A lot of times you, when you struggle and you don't see relative strength, you want to look at the chart and see if you're looking at a consolidation period. Because if the S&P is going up and your area, whatever you're looking at, has been sideways consolidating, it's going to underperform on a relative basis. And then a lot of times that relative basis gets that jolt that it needs to the upside when you get an absolute breakout. And so that's what we saw with the XLY. I got the breakout and we got the relative strength picking back up. All right, let's move on to the inflation area here. So is inflation real or is it not real? Well, let me just say it's real. Maybe a better question would be, is it short-term or long-term? Um, I mean, if you've been anywhere, if you're looking at food prices, gas prices, uh, lumber prices, um, many of the commodities, I mean, prices are going up. We've seen that, it's real. So. It's not a question. This isn't smoke and mirrors. But I think it's real because of the imbalance in demand and supply. The supply chain issues um, combined with everyone wanting to get out after the COVID-19 pandemic of 2020. So you got all this pent up demand that's being unleashed at a time when the supply is, you know, there's a constraint on the supply and we're trying to get things back on board. I mean, I just go in sometimes to even a Starbucks and the demand, you know, the people coming in, the lines are much longer than they used to be and the staff shortages. Um, it's, it's just this combination that's, that's, you know, driving a lot of prices higher. So if you're in industry groups where there've been supply issues, which is most industry groups, by the way, then you're going to see this increased demand versus low supply. And that's economics 101. So this is real. So what I have on this chart, and I wanted to show you, here's the S&P 500 for the last 20 years, just a line chart, a monthly chart. This panel right here is the core PPI with the rate of change 12 months, and I have an invisible chart. So only thing you're seeing here is a 12 month rate of change. You're not seeing the PPI data on here. And the way you do this on the chart is if you show price action like this, over here, it'll automatically just give you a line chart. But if you, if you uh, click on invisible, then it'll show you nothing. But you need to put an overlay in so that the overlay will appear. If I don't have an overlay and I put it on invisible, we won't even see it, it'll just be blank. So here's where we show the rate of change. So I want you to look at this because is it real or not? 
yes, it's real. We're now at a 20-year high on the year-over-year core PPI, 5.5%. Here's the scale over here on the left side, by the way, of percentage. Um, this is actually the, the uh, PPI readings. But remember, we've got the data hidden. hidden. So all we've got is the rate of change showing up. But this rate of change is based on the scale here on the left side. So 5.55%. The core CPI is 4.58. <clears throat> and last month, what I was saying was maybe the CPI was already starting to roll over. And it simply, um, you know, all the PPI, the producer price index, maybe businesses had decided, hey, we're not going to pass it on. Well, it turned back up again with the data this week. So it's moved to a new high at 4.58%. But again, 20-year high. The next panel I have here is real estate. Now, if you notice the move back in 20, well, 2009 to 2011, again, coming out of the financial crisis, do you see the move up here in the annual rate of change in the PPI, core PPI? It, was, it also followed suit on the core CPI. So they were both going up. Look at real estate outperforming during this period. Real estate's an area that should do better than most areas during periods of inflation. If you look back at the technology group during this period, it was mostly flat with the S&P. So real estate clearly going up, technology mostly flat. And then the 10-year treasury yield, look at the, the bond market. So we, we had these inflation scare, what looked like a pretty good scare in inflation. You know, we were coming up off these lows. The bond market was yawning. Bond market was saying, we don't have an inflation problem. And sure enough, we pulled back off of that and went sideways for a long time. And we stayed very close to this 2%. You know, the Fed always talks about this 2% target. Let me annotate this and just drop in these uh, lines. So there's your 2% target. I mean, I think the Fed's done a pretty good job of keeping inflation right around that 2% level on both the, the core PPI and the core CPI. Um, but here we had moved above their target and real estate you know, did pretty well, but the bond market was saying, this is not an inflation problem. You would be selling bonds if you were concerned about inflation, which would send the, the yields up, but that was not the case. Now, if I look at what's going on right now, I see, I mean, we're soaring even more than we did before on both core PPI and core CPI. And yet real estate has been, for the most part, just kind of, I mean, it started to move up a little bit, but it's not even close to its, you know, looking over the last handful of years, it's not even close to its relative high. It's been downtrending. So yeah, it's ticking up a little bit. Look at technology. I would argue technology over the last five or six months has done better than real estate. Um, I think if we looked at the numbers, it would prove me out. This has been a better area than real estate in a time when inflation is going through the roof. That makes no sense. What about the treasury yields? Well, I mean, we've come up a little, but we're still way down. And look, really from the time that the inflation scare really started, when we really began jumping, the yield's lower than where it was back then. This is when we got up to that 1.75% area. So we're not getting this mass exodus out of treasuries. Why would you want to own 1.56% treasuries if inflation is going to keep going up at 5, 6, 7%? You're just wasting, you're throwing money down a rat hole. So yes, the inflation is real, but the reaction in the equity and bond markets is not true. I mean, Wall Street is not looking at this as though this is going to be a problem. And that's what I focus on. I don't fo focus on the, the media's uh, interpretation or the, the, the uh, fear mongering. That I don't care about. What I care about is what Wall Street is saying, because this is where all the money's going. This is where all the MBAs are telling, you know, they're uh, fellow firms, where they should be putting their money. And so I'm just not seeing it. So yes, it's real in terms of seeing it on the chart and seeing it at the stores and seeing it everywhere. But is it real longer term? I don't think so. And this is why. So 
you can disagree. You know, this is certainly a, a very hotly contested and hotly debated topic right now, but I do not believe this is going to last. I believe we're going to see something very similar to when we saw yields going or um, inflation going up, you know, a decade ago, even though it's gone up more this time. I think it's because of the pandemic. I mean, we got a hundred year pandemic. You, we, you can't compare it really to any other period because it's just different. Everything, the way the economy was shut down, I've, in my lifetime, I've never seen the economy shut down. I don't know what that supposed to look like and how we're supposed to come out of that. We're all going to find out together, but I believe it's short term. I think this is a transitory move. All right, let's move on to earnings spotlight. Um, start off with Disney. Disney came out with its earnings. They were not good. Um, and I'm going to give you the pre-market. Uh, Disney, you can see down 10 bucks, almost 6%. They were expected to earn 51 cents. They earned 37. So if you want to know why Disney has not been performing, this is a, a perfect example of what I was just talking about. Listen to what Wall Street is saying. Wall Street has its analysts going out, meeting with Disney's management frequently. And they come back and they're not buying. On a relative basis, they're not buying Disney. Right now they're buying Netflix. They're not buying Disney. So you want to buy Netflix. You don't want to buy Disney. And, you know, now the earnings come out and we see what's going on. They missed. Not Shouldn't be a surprise. But this, if we open at 164 this morning, you're going to see that's down below these recent lows. So Disney's going to be under some considerable pressure at the open today. All right. Um, let's see. What else do we have? How about, you know, I wanted to bring this MQ up. It's probably a company you've never even heard of. This is Marketa. Um, and the reason I'm bringing this up, they beat on their earnings. They were expected to lose 20 cents. They lost eight cents. But this is a company that's on our short squeeze chart list. And when I, get a, when I see a company that had this huge move like this pulled back and then has an easy beat on their bottom line and the stock is now up 15%, it could be a situation where those on the short side could be under pressure later. Um, we'll see. I mean, if, you know, you've probably got some that shorted up in this area. They're not going to be overly concerned with a move to 28 or 29. But if this starts moving up into the 30s, you're going to see more and more shorts that are underwater and could add to perhaps a short squeeze to the upside. So I just wanted to point this one out. Um, Looking at a couple of others this morning that reported, I did not, I haven't seen the earnings, but I can see if we got any kind of reaction. All right, so Yeti reported stock down three dollars and fifty cents, so back down a little bit below a hundred. I would be watching to see if it holds the twenty-day moving average as we go forward. Um, I don't know. And then another one that's reporting this morning is uh, Tapestry (TPR) and Tapestry. You can see up six percent today in uh, um, pre-market action. It looks like it's going to clear to about a four or five month high. So that would be good news if these gains hold into the closing bill. All right, just a couple of quick little um, companies for the three you must see. Uh, they're not little companies though, but uh, Boeing. Boeing seems to be getting started here. This is one I'm watching very closely. I actually own a little bit of Boeing. Uh, but I like this move back to the upside. Accumulation distribution starting to move up with it. We'll see whether it continues. But Boeing's in the industrial area and tends to do well in November. So we'll see whether or not that continues. Another industrial, GE, came out and announced the split. Three companies gapped up to 115, couldn't get through, pulling back. I think the 20-day could be an opportunity, though, to get in there. And then finally, I'm just going to pull up McDonald's, which is a consumer discretionary restaurant name. It broke out recently, pulling back, but this is another one I like off that 20-day. All right, that's it for me. I really appreciate you tuning in. Everybody have a great day and happy trading. Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.